We've talked about educated idiots, those people whose academic prowess exceeds their common sense by a light year. We've talked about useful idiots, those people who don't let their lack of complete knowledge prevent them from engaging in activism on the issues. This week, we're going to talk about another type of idiot. This idiot firmly believes that the narrative is everything and that it belongs to them. The truth, at least as far as they define the truth, is far more important than facts. They combine the characteristics of educated idiots and useful idiots into a miasma of bias and message. That's right, we're going to talk about the media idiocracy. Grab a cup of coffee and a pastry because it's time for some roasted opinions. I've talked about both the mainstream media and social media before, several times in fact. Rather than cover that ground again, I recommend that you look back at my previous videos. This one about yellow journalism is particularly relevant. Boiled down to its basics, both the mainstream media and social media are engaging in yellow journalism. They're choosing sides in every debate and pushing an agenda every day. This is readily apparent to anyone who looks at media with a critical eye. When a satirical website like Babylon B or The Onion produces headlines which are mistaken for actual news, there's a real problem going on with media companies which pretend to report real news. There are some companies like Fox News, The Epic Times, Breitbart, and The Daily Caller who are pushing a conservative agenda. Compared to the number of companies pushing a liberal agenda, though, they are definitely in the minority. CNN, MSNBC, CNBC, The Daily Beast, Fox Media, Media Matters, Reuters, The Associated Press, The Huffington Post, the list goes on and on. Each of these companies has a demonstrated bias, and for most of them, it's definitely a left-wing bias. The problem with that is that many of the outlets with a left-wing bias, and for that matter, the watchdog organizations which would normally call out the bias of these outlets, are firmly convinced that they are in the middle of the road. Take a look at this chart, prepared by Adfontes Media. Look where the outlets which common sense tells people are decidedly left of center are listed. The biggest outlets in the legacy media are placed as most reliable on this chart. That's insane, because the reality of bias in the media looks more like this chart from AllSides.com, or this chart from Cheryl Atkinson. There's a definite shift towards biased reporting these days, so much so that I believe even William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer would have blinked. It's bad enough that a whole genre of commentary channels has risen up on social media, just like this channel here. As independent creators, commentary channels talk about the subjects which interest them. More often than not, though, the content that independent creators post is countering the biased reporting that comes out of the mainstream media. Why? Because everyone has opinions, most of those opinions aren't unique in a world of over 7 billion people, and everyone wants to know that they aren't alone in those opinions. Independent creators are commenting, not on the news, but largely on the biased reporting which they find. It's a constant stream of reaction reporting, which is honestly part of the reason why I've never claimed that Roasted Opinions is a news channel. I post commentary, not news. I could not in good conscience call my content news without putting reporters on the ground to document the events directly. My conscience also doesn't allow me to call my content news without an editor looking over every story with a critical eye to eliminate bias and check the facts, nor without an editor-in-chief to recheck the work of both the reporter and the editor to ensure that the reporting is fact-based and free from bias. That's what news outlets are supposed to do. I do nearly all the work for this channel, which is why my closing credits fit neatly onto one page. And to be honest, many if not most of the channels like this one on social media are small operations with just a few people contributing if they aren't being run by a solo creator. In my mind, that makes them commentary channels, and I bet that most of those channels would be comfortable with that label considering the fact that they're not going out to report directly on the events. Those that don't consider themselves to be commentary channels adopt the label of comedy channel, and in my opinion, that's primarily because of another serious problem, platform curation. I've covered bias in social media platforms before, too. This link will take you to another video about that bias and my opinions about Section 230 concerns. 
In short, though, it boils down to huge platforms being marketed as a chance for creators to post our own original content and have our own say. That marketing is deceptive, though. Say the wrong thing, and your posted content will be hidden, demonetized, or deleted. Talk about the wrong subject or in the wrong way, and your entire account can be hidden, demonetized, and deleted. Creators are aware that they have to abide by the terms of service to keep their access to the platform, but those terms change all of the time and not always with any public notice. Detailed explanations from the platforms when they act on content would certainly help out creators, but by and large the explanations which are provided to creators are very nonspecific. Without warning, it's possible that an entire account can be yeeted off the platform. It doesn't matter that the creator has invested years of work in the account. It doesn't matter that the creator may be counting on the income from that account. Channel deleted, do not pass go, do not collect the balances rightfully earned before the incident, do not attempt to start over because when the platform finds out, the new account will be deleted as well. This applies to content on YouTube, of course. Something else applies to social media in general, though. The shadow ban. Google and other major tech companies have a bias, too. When what online users say doesn't match up to that bias, those tech companies suppress the content. AdSense is a Google product and dominates online advertising. So Google can demonetize your content even if you aren't on YouTube by preventing ad placements on other web pages. It doesn't totally demonetize that content thanks to alternate methods of monetization like Patreon, but Patreon won't let certain content be monetized through their services either. Companies that do allow controversial content, in other words, content which doesn't match the mainstream bias, are quickly branded as alt-right platforms. It could be because those companies refuse to remove content that upsets the left, or it could be because big tech wants to maintain their effective monopoly. But anytime someone comes up with an alternative to Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube that allows people previously banned from those platforms to start over, those platforms are quickly labeled alt-right. That might explain why so many content creators who are posting commentary label their channels as comedy. There's a little bit of leeway granted if the content is supposed to be comedic in nature. Comedy channels are also boosted more than commentary channels are. And that brings us to the real problem, the simple fact that we cannot discuss certain problems at all. The far-left progressives and the far-right reactionaries have launched a war for the soul of America on both the mainstream media and social media. That's the culture war, and it's being fought as we speak by idiots who are happy to identify docs and cancel anyone who draws their ire. It'd be bad enough if cancel culture was just booting people out of public platforms, both in real life and in the digital public square. But cancel culture warriors on both sides are aiming to do more than just silence people. They want to destroy lives. Jobs are at stake. Businesses are at stake. Even careers are at stake. Say something which some random activist group has deemed to be racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, in short, deplorable, and the digital mobs may just come ravening after you, prepared to completely destroy your life. This used to be just a problem associated with social justice warriors, but the alt-right has noticed just how effective cancel culture is at silencing dissent, and some of those idiots are starting to pick up the weapons of cancel culture to use as well, and all for the possession of the soul of America, through undisputed control of the conversation. Let me be clear, though. The soul of America belongs to the people of America, not to activist groups, not to activist platforms, and not to activist media. We own it, all 330 million of us, collectively. Frankly, I'm tired of politicians, activists, and media companies trying to take control of America away from the rest of us. There's been rioting for weeks in this country. Local governments, state governments, and the federal government are arguing with each other as if each of them is independent from the others instead of interdependent. State governments are passing laws which directly contradict federal law. City governments are telling the federal government that it doesn't have jurisdiction in their cities. People are dying. Businesses are being destroyed. Monuments and institutions are being pulled down. And the public square isn't safe anymore. And I could just as easily be talking about what the rioters are doing as I could be talking about what COVID is doing or what is happening on the internet. Couldn't I? There are real problems out there and they need to be solved, yet many people cannot talk about those problems because their take on what's going on doesn't fit the freaking narrative that the dominant media is pushing on the rest of the country. We can't talk about the fact that Joe Biden is an empty suit, or that his campaign is effectively hiding him and letting the media campaign for him. 
We can't talk about police brutality or what might be contributing to the problem because the media has already decided what's going on and brooks no dissent. We can't talk about COVID because the media has already determined that no matter what happens, everything negative is because of Trump and everything positive is because of someone else, if ever they allow positive news about COVID to be published in the first place. We can't discuss those problems because cancel culture, the culture which the media created, is silencing voices of those who dissent with their narrative. Voices which in many cases cannot afford to risk their jobs, their businesses, their future careers over the response to their opinions. Individual voices which cannot hope to compete with a narrative formed by educated idiots and pushed by useful idiots on platforms controlled by media idiots. The world is not a media idiocracy, but you couldn't tell by looking at it. The major social media platforms can affect the results of an election by up to 10 points according to a recent study. Yet just a few companies dominate social media, effectively controlling that portion of the election results. No company should have control of a free and fair election. The FEC regulations specify that companies cannot contribute to campaigns specifically for this reason. It's time for the FEC to take a good hard look at how much bias there is in mainstream and social media companies and consider classifying any efforts to control the public discourse as in-kind contributions to political campaigns. It's time for social media platforms to be required by law to provide timely and detailed answers to their users regarding every decision they make which affects the accounts of those users, whether it's a decision to restrict access to content, a decision to deny access to the platform, or a decision to prevent access to profit-sharing programs for user accounts which otherwise qualify based on their size and activity. And by timely, I mean within 48 hours if content is going to be demonetized. That way the user has time to make edits to their content so that it can be monetized. Regarding accounts, 30 days should be long enough for anybody to review the account and make a decision providing detailed examples in their response as to why an account cannot be monetized. Any longer than that, and creators are just spinning their wheels, depending on the false promises of free and fair access that the platforms are making. The media companies don't own speech. We the people own speech, and it's about time the government put a stop to cancel culture once and for all.